Hey everyone, I'm Maddie. I'm Chase. And today we're going to be talking about six things that we wish we would have known before starting medical school. Let's get started. So the first thing on our list is the importance of picking the right school. This seems like after the fact, but I wish we would have known about this when we were choosing the schools that we were accepted to uh, before you know, matriculating into that program. Each school is different, and I wish I would have spent more time seriously considering the pros and cons that each school has to offer. I think we really lucked into the school that fit us best. Um, but you can definitely pay attention on your interviews and look into YouTube videos and stuff like that. Um, I felt like interview days were most helpful in speaking to the students who actually go to the school and hearing them talk about what exactly their typical day looks like on that particular campus. Right, so each school I feel like has their own environment and I wish I would have looked at what the students who were giving us a tour, the students that we ran across on campus, uh, what their day looked like. Um, I know that sounds pretty generic, but some schools have very strict rules on what their students are allowed to do and what they can't, such as dress code. Some schools don't even allow food in their university, like on their, in their health science campus. Um, other, other schools could have crazy requirements that you have to go to every single class. A lot of schools have maybe more of a eight to five. Uh, they treat it like a job. So you're actually on campus five days a week from eight to five. You get an hour lunch break during the day and then you go home and you do your studying and you do your reading. Um, and like Chase said, some schools are more flexible. Then there's schools like the one we go to where class is optional for like 95% of the time which is really convenient for us because we are students who use a lot of outside resources, which is something we're gonna talk about later. Um, but overall, I think that recognizing what the average lifestyle and expectations that the school holds upon their students is something that we think is the number one thing that students or applicants need to really pay attention towards. So another thing that you need to consider is the style of grading in the school itself. So for example, our school is pass-fail. As long as we get overall above a 70%, we're good to go, we get to move on. Um, but a lot of schools have a ranking system or maybe a mandated percentage that X number of students have to fail um, each assignment. So it's graded on a curve and then if you're 25th percentile or less, you automatically fail even if you got an 85% overall. Right, and I think that would lead to a like a negative environment that I don't personally want to be involved in, but maybe that's something that you thrive on is that kind of competition, but... Um, Medical school is stressful enough. I feel like you don't need to be purposely pinned against your classmates, especially in first and second year. Like our school, we are ranked in third and fourth year, but that's more of an independent thing and um, it really is dependent on your performance and how you get along with the people in clinic. So I, I just feel like you're still adjusting in first and second year and there's no reason to bring that competition and um, kind of decrease the camaraderie among you and your classmates. Right. Because our school, we're literally just going to have a P next to our transcript for year one, year two. Whereas other schools could have grades for everything. Um, I mean, that's how laid back our school is. And then there's other schools, like Maddie said, that are, you know, have a mandate of, you know, 15 to 25 percent of their students have to fill each unit, which I don't want to be a part of by any means. So the second point that we want to talk about is when you do get to med school, the amount of resources that there are, um, particularly the outside resources, the extra books, the extra videos that you can watch, besides what school your school has to offer. Um, this didn't really make a lot of sense to me before actually getting into medical school. I know the summer before we got to school, um, Chase really researched a lot of this. I had no idea what he was talking about. He made me buy this book called First Aid, and I was like, okay. Um, but it really is important. There are so many outside resources. They're basically 
um, videos that are supplemental to what your class is teaching you or what you need to know for your board exam. So it's concise. We're going to make a separate video on all the resources that we use and the resources that we recommend and our classmates use. Um, so watch out for that video. Um, but overall, um, you can have there. There are way more resources that you will ever have time for or should use in medical school. That's honestly probably half the battle is figuring out what resources you want to use and are willing to pay for, and what resources maybe don't work better, don't work best for you, or you could do without. Because I know, I think we both feel this way. Um, you want to use everything just because you feel like you have to and your classmates are using one resource but you're using another one and you feel like you should be using this one because they're going to be better prepared than you or what are you missing out on and um, you just really need to trust yourself and kind of there's free trials so figure out what you like and what you don't like and stick to that because there's no reason to spend your money and time on something that doesn't work. I agree. So this kind of rolls into our third point. Um, I know this is changing for the class of 2024 and on, uh, but the importance that your board scores have on your future. So our year, um, the last class is actually going to have a step one score that is not pass fail. Um, our class. Our class, class of 2023. So we are taking a, a test at the end of our second year a lot of people take it into their third year, um, and it's called step one. And for us, that kind of determines what specialty we can go into. Um, the higher your score, the more competitive you are, and just like your MCAT. Um, but then there's another test at the end of your third year called step two. And for us, that is a less important exam, and historically it's been less important. Um, it's based on clinical knowledge, and basically as long as you score relatively okay, uh, interviewers for residency programs are fine with it. Um, for upcoming classes after us, step two is going to be weighted more heavily. So there's going to be more importance uh, based on clinical um, knowledge, which I think is fantastic, but um, it kind of draws out your stress level to the end of third year instead of the end of second year. Right. So um, just understanding that now step two is going to be what residency programs are going to you know, basically hold you to for how good of a clinician you're going to be. Um, as unfair as that may sound, that's what the that's what history has shown to that medical school or residency programs look for. So just knocking those out of the ballpark is so important. And that's something that we didn't know uh, really was a thing, but step one, step two, and then step three, taking residency. But we didn't really know that those were, you know, as important as they are. So another thing that is important in applying to residency programs is research. I know that that's uh, always kind of a hot button question when you're applying to medical school. Do I need research? How much research do I need? Um, no, you don't need research to apply to medical school. Um, it helps for sure, but you don't. It's definitely not necessary. Applying to residency is a little bit different. You should have some form of research just because. Honestly, probably that's how the majority of universities make their money and get recognition is through research. So that's important that you have at least some experience. Um, typically, the more competitive residency you're applying towards, the more research you need to have. A lot of people applying to more competitive residencies, such as plastic surgery, orthopedic surgery, dermatology, will take a gap year in between their preclinical years, so between second year and third year to do a research year. So that way they really buff up the research that they have, get a ton of publications, and will look really good for residency. Now, for the majority of people who are not applying to those residencies, um, that's definitely not necessary. But uh, getting on a research project is important. Um, for example, family medicine, you don't really need a ton of research. I would say a couple of projects showing that you showed a little bit of interest that that would be good enough. So the fifth point that we have is just how diverse your class is going to be. Um, you know going through undergrad everybody you know typically is the same age, 
they may all look the same, they have similar backgrounds, but when you get to medical school, I feel like the diversity just completely explodes. There are people who went to Ivy Leagues and people who went to community colleges. There's people who are you know, 10 years younger than you and people who are 20 years older than you. Um, different backgrounds, socioeconomic levels, um, and then you just have people who are just generally a lot smarter than you. Learning things definitely doesn't come super easily to either one of us. It's something we have to put work into. And I guess it was pretty surprising to meet people whose brains are just so incredible. And they can just look at something or hear something and it's in their brain forever. And it's just stuck in there and they don't really have to worry about it again. So that's obviously frustrating, but um, really cool at the same time. And uh, it's just kind of strange to see all these different people who have different strengths um, coming together. Right, so building off that, people being you know, seemingly more smart than us. There's people who have PhDs or master's degrees already in topics, such as like anatomy. There's a lot of people who have masters of anatomy before they come to medical school. Several have taught actually at other universities, have taught medical students at other universities before coming to medical school themselves. So there's always going to be someone who is, you know, more educated in a topic and that can be frustrating, but if you use that, you know, towards your advantage and learn from them, I think that's the best way to go about it. A lot of schools have maybe more of a 8 to 5, uh, they treat it like a job, so you're actually on campus 5 days a week from 8 to 5, you get an hour lunch break during the day and then you go home and you do your studying and you do your reading um, and like Chase said, some schools are more flexible. Like Chase said, um, the age range is just crazy. So Chase, we think, is actually the youngest person in our class. Um, so we are second years right now, just started, and he is 22. So because he skipped a year in college, we're assuming that he's the youngest. We haven't met anybody younger than him. Uh, and then the oldest person in our class, I think, is... 46. 46, yeah. And he has obviously had a whole career prior to this and decided to come to medical school, which is amazing and good for him. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't do it, but... Um, Right, so the, I mean, there's someone who's literally twice my age, yeah. over twice my age. Yeah. So there is a there's a pretty large diversity in terms of age, and then there's people who are married and have children. Yeah. Who will bring their kids to class? So like the uh, and then there's us who obviously don't have kids. So um, and the number of people who are are married or engaged really is a large number of people. So if you're in that kind of community, that's something that you can look forward to. So finally, um, we're going to talk about gunners. Now, this is a term that you will hear throughout medical school, I feel like, and this word describes people who are just really hardcore um, studiers, just really gunning for that top spot at wherever. Um, and at our university, we're lucky because it does have an environment that fosters camaraderie and teamwork and really getting to know our classmates. So, um, but we have heard of other universities who don't have the same environment. And so a gunner would be somebody who would go and rip out pages in a textbook that you need to read from the library. Or um, delete something from a shared Google Drive. And building off that, so even though our school does have a good sense of community, there are students who are still like purposely try to sabotage you which is horrible, but it will happen. I promise you that. So, you know, personal experience, we have a, go a Google Drive that our school has, not our school, but the students have, that have information about previous years, what are high yield facts that we should know for class. Just like a lot of consolidated information that it's a legacy drive. So it's been passed on for years and years and we all have full access to it. Um, and we noticed some documents were disappearing and at first we thought it was just us or a problem that we had and then our friends were bringing it up to us and um, yeah so we, we kind of figured out that there was a student who was deleting these things so that it was more difficult for 
but the rest of us to learn it. So that's definitely frustrating, but um, you're going to have to deal with it wherever you go. So just be prepared for that. And then our sixth point that we have, our bonus point, is the number of times that your specialty is going to change your career, what you predict that your career is going to look like. Uh, I came into medical school having no idea what I wanted to do. If somebody asks me, I'll still claim that I have no idea what I want to do. Um, I definitely have a short list, but um, I feel like this was definitely more of a shock for Chase than it was for me. Yeah, so I came to medical school and I feel like I was a very stereotypical guy who said I want to be an orthopedic surgeon, no question about it, I'm confident that's what I want to go into. And then I feel like after the first semester, the first thread we had, I was like, I want nothing to do with surgery. So that really threw me off, you know, I had in my mind since undergrad that I was going to be an orthopedic surgeon. And then I have bounced between radiology and ER and psych and family med and internal medicine. And I feel like the list just keeps going. So realizing that even though people will tell you that your specialty will probably change, odds are it will no matter what you think. I haven't met, I don't think I've met anybody who is still on their first choice of specialties. And then that will change in third and fourth year, definitely. So You're just exposed to so many different specialties that you didn't even know existed or didn't realize how the lifestyle was. Um, I think coming in, OB was definitely on my short list. Um, I hadn't ruled it out until I found out or realized that babies aren't born on a schedule and uh, you can't plan for that. So that definitely moved that to the bottom of my list. <laughs> But overall, you will determine, or you will find different specialties that you never heard of. Um, there are plenty that we we didn't know existed in our, you know, board certified specialties. But uh, overall, just make sure that you shadow as much as possible because you can shadow in medical school, um, and we really recommend doing that. Our school did a really good job of. Um bringing in people who are from unique specialties and just having them talk to us for 45 minutes just to open our eyes to these different things that we probably would have never heard of otherwise and that was super cool but you may not be as fortunate and so like Chase said definitely look into um, different specialties and since you're a medical student they are way more understanding than they were when you were a pre-med. They are way more respectful of your time. Um, I know that as a pre-med, I always felt pressured to stay for the whole day or stay for um, like all the way till the end, I felt like, and just follow this person around all day. When you tell people, when you tell physicians that you're a medical student, they're like, oh, okay, why don't you come in from 10 to noon and I'll see what the best thing I can find for you is. Yeah. And so it's just, it's great. Yeah, so um, definitely there are physicians that help foster your interest and they will try to push you towards your specialty but that's probably because that's what they do for a living so if you guys want to see more videos like this or have us expand upon any points please reach out to us um, email comment down below if you like this video hit the like button hit the subscribe button for more videos like this uh, like we say in all our other videos we do have a book um, on getting into medical school so I know we talked about starting medical school but if you're just not there yet um, Please look for our book. We have a link in the description box down below. Yeah. See you next time.